encouragement to you. James, thank you for your heart, your faith, your leadership. I needed to be here. I'm sure we all feel this is exactly where I need to be today. So it's January 1991, and I wake up in the morning, and I have a knot uh, in the pit of my stomach, like one of those knots you have maybe before you go tell that boss who's really believed in you and brought you up that you're going to leave the organization. Or maybe that difficult, crucial conversation with a spouse or somebody you really care about. So with this knot in my stomach, I get up and I go to work and I, I zip up my flight suit and I walk down a passageway and I step out onto a metal grate and the ocean is crashing 60 feet below me as I'm looking down. And I turn to my right and I take three steps up onto the flight deck of the USS Independence. It's a Navy aircraft carrier. And immediately this hot 30 mile an hour wind blasts me in the face. It's 7.30 in the morning, it's already 113 degrees. And the air is thick with the smell of grease and hydraulic fluid and jet exhaust. And that knot in my stomach just got tighter. And I look across the flight deck and there is my F-14 Tomcat and it is loaded for the first time with live bombs and missiles. And this just got real because today, is my first flight into combat. What I know is my wingman's life depends on all the decisions that I have to make today. And my life depends on the decisions that he makes. And we are assigned to do close air support, which means we are supporting troops on the ground and every single decision in that environment has life or death consequences. So what do you do? I walk over to my jet, and I start going through my pre-flighting and I check the weapons and I crawl up in the, in the airplane and I get the engines and as they roared to life, I'm, I'm sitting there with just my self-doubt about what I'm about to do for a moment. Before the flight deck officer taxis me up to the catapult and the shuttle, uh, the, there's a launch bar in our nose gear and it locks down in the shuttle so we can't move and he has me go to full power. The airplane's rattling and shaking and the Final check crews running all over to make sure every part of this airplane is safe to launch out into Iraq. And I look down at the flight deck officer, and he looks up at me and he does this. And that means to go to zone five afterburn. So I take the throttles and I push them all the way up. And we are now burning 2,000 pounds of fuel per minute. 50 feet of flame are shooting out of the back of this jet. We are rattling, we are shaking, and we're humming. And the last thing that I have to do before they launch me is give the flight tech officer a salute. And right before I do that, what do you guys think is going through my mind? I literally could not raise my hand. I'm like, don't launch. Don't launch me. I am not ready. Evidently, I saluted because boom, zero to 150 miles an hour in 2.4 seconds, and I was off, flying up into combat into Iraq. And I started thinking about that moment. Like, was I prepared in that moment? I try to think of all the incredible mentors in my life, the men and women who'd sewn into me and shaped me. My father, my commanding officer, his call sign was Darth, for Darth Vader. You did not want to be on his bad side. You guys might know some folks like that, but he was an incredible mentor to me. And my wife, we've been now married for, for 30 years. And, but what I realized was, you know what, there's people through my life that saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And they started to believe in me until I believed in myself more. And I, and I started moving forward because there's times that we have to move through something that we don't feel prepared for. Maybe like today, what's going on in the world. Some of us don't feel prepared, but it doesn't mean we can stop, right? We're all out here, we're doing this. What I did not realize at the time was that was the role that God wanted to play in my life. As my father, my friend, my mentor, my discipler. So we get back from this combat cruise, and I get a call. John, it's the, uh, the commanding officer wants to see in the stateroom. That is, that's not good. That's like, hey, go see the principal. And I walk down the passageway, and I'm like, have this dread building, because his call sign was steamer, 
because of his anger issues. And he was proud of his call sign, by the way. And as I got closer to his stateroom, it was getting worse. And he goes, hey, Rammer, that was my call sign, uh, last name Ramstead, sit down. I'm like, okay. He goes, guess what? You are going to Top Gun. I'm like, "Uh uh-uh. I literally, man, this was a dream come true. This hasn't been something I've been thinking about and dreaming about for four years of my life, and it just came true. I think I floated out of his office. I don't, I don't even think I could tell you what even happened the entire rest of that next day. And on Saturday of that weekend, I'm playing softball with some friends, and all of a sudden, somebody goes, look out! And I turn, and a line drive drills me in the face, blows out my eye socket, I have permanent nerve damage, and I'm done. I'm out. I lost my medical. Six months later, the Navy processed me out, and I'm on the street. And what do you do when everything about you, your identity, which was who I was, my rank, my title, what I did, was external? And a dream that I literally had since I was a kid was ripped away. I don't think I've ever been so functionally depressed in my life. My first job I ever got was as a telemarketer. I couldn't get another job. I was an electrical engineer who'd never engineered. I was a pilot that couldn't fly. I couldn't find a job in 1995. I lasted at that telemarketing company for about two months. And then I got a job selling cell phones. And I was going in uh, Tierra Santa, knocking on doors, hoping people were home so I could sell them a cell phone. And the sounds of my dreams are roaring overhead. They come back into Miramar. I literally didn't even know how to take a next step forward. And it was in that period of life that there was three men that came around me. And John Maxwell always says, you know what we have to do? We have to connect before we pull. And these guys started asking me questions. They started figuring out, what are you good at? What are your strengths? What would you like to do? What can we help you with? They started mentoring me. They started discipling me. And then they invited me to a Christian leadership conference. Now, I grew up in the church, going to church every Sunday. I was in the youth group. I was the leader of the youth group. We did mission trips. And I had never, though, in my life connected to a personal relationship with Jesus. It had just never happened for me. I always felt like I was a good guy. I was moral. I made good decisions. I never even dated in college until I met Donna in my senior year. And now we've been married for 30 years. Um, And they tricked me. Because this was a leadership conference, and everybody was invited. But they said, oh, John, the best teaching, the good stuff. It's Sunday morning. And, you know, because it's just really a church service, we can can just pull the cover off and get right to the stuff that's going to really help you with your career. I'm like, okay, I'm in. So I show up, and I'm in the front row because I want to learn the secret to go make money. And as he starts sharing the gospel, I start leaning forward. And I start feel, feeling all hot and flushed. And my hands are just sweating. And he called us up. There's an invite. Come forward if you want to accept Christ as your Savior. And I start to get up out of my chair. And I feel my wife grab my arm and yank me back in my chair and say, don't you embarrass me. Now, being the man of the house, I looked at her and I said, okay. And then the pastor said, there's one guy. I'm like, oh, come on. He said, oh, there's still one guy. We'll wait for you. I'm sitting there. I'm sweating more. He says it again. Next thing I knew, I'm, I am up front. I don't even know where my wife is at this point. And as he says the prayer and I'm repeating it, I just feel myself being filled with like, it's like cool, cold water, replacing this hot coffee that was inside me. And I'm just weeping uncontrollably. And my friend Jeff, who invited me, I felt this strong, firm shoulder come, or hand, on my shoulder. And I put my hand over here to put my hand on Jeff's hand, and there's no hand there. It was Christ standing right next to me. Absolutely transformed my life in that moment. I had this new love, this new excitement. All the things of the world that I used to do going to the officer's club, going out. I was no longer interested in it. But guess what? My wife wanted no part of this. 
And I'll never forget, a couple months later, one in the morning, my wife was still out partying with our friends. And I called my friend Jeff. I said, what do I do? I got to get her to believe. We got to change this. I got to fix this. I got to do this right now. He goes, let me give you some advice. He goes, God loved you unconditionally your whole life until you were 27 when you finally figured it out. What if you just love your wife unconditionally? You work on yourself and you work on your relationship with the Lord and trust him. Best advice I ever had because a year later, she went forward. We got baptized together in the ocean in San Diego and started a family. Now, I'm still, though, trying to figure all this out. And I get a call from a friend of mine in Minnesota, and he's like, hey, move back to Minnesota. Start a company with me. I was still not in a good place. I was still trying to figure out who I was, what I should do in this world, what I ended up doing by getting into business too early, this guy Larry was the best man in my wedding and I was the best man in his wedding. And you know what I did, us working together, I not only destroyed a company, but I destroyed a friendship. Because I thought everything, now that I'm a Christian, was going to be much more straightforward. I really did. So then I started working at a software company, a startup data mining software company, 90 hours a week. It's the fall of 1999. On paper, I am now worth $17 million. I'm working six days a week. I'm traveling five, uh, uh, three or four days a week. And when the internet bubble popped within 90 days, not only was all that taken away again, but I was six figures in debt and I had to start over again. So at that point, what happened was, there was a shift. And I started going from trusting God to saying, maybe I have to take more control. And I started saying to myself, you know what? I might not be the sharpest tool in the shed. And I know God's kind of up on the hill, like the commanding officer. I still hadn't connected to who he really was. He's got my back, but I can't, I don't know if I can really go to him and say, I'm really having a bad day and I need a hug. I didn't know if I could do that. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna outwork everybody around me. And that is gonna be my motto. So in 2008, the CEO of, I was now working for a big Wall Street company, asked me to come here to Colorado, manage the office and grow it, and I'd been here. I ended up starting two uh, nonprofits, Colorado Faith and Freedom Coalition and Colorado Rough Riders. What I was doing was seeking validation for this identity that I'd still never connected to externally. About what I did, about who I knew, about where my kids went to school, what car I drove, this, it was all part of how I operated. And from the outside in, if you saw me at that time, you'd be like, wow, he's doing really good. The way the world defines success, I was at the top of my game. And I got to tell you guys, maybe you've been there. I was absolutely miserable. Sometimes I was so grumpy, my wife sometimes didn't even want me to come home after work. And sometimes I didn't even feel like coming home after work. I realized I was in this place of what I would call smoldering discontent because over time, if we're a pilot and you lose track of that destination or your compass is off and you slowly drift off course, right? I love that casting crown song, right? A man doesn't fall in a day. And I had drifted so far off course. Instead of landing in Los Angeles, I think I was somewhere over Antarctica. And this smoldering discontent was just bubbling inside me and I didn't know what to do with it. So I decided I'm going to leave the Wall Street company and go start another company. And some friends of mine, that's got to be the answer. And it was during this time I got introduced to a friend of mine who's on the board of Family Talk with Dr. James Dobson. And I get invited uh, to a retreat that he's doing. And I had a small plane I used for business. I flew up to Great Falls, Montana on Thursday to have a wonderful evening. And on Friday, we're all going to go horseback riding to the back of this property for lunch. And I'm the first one saddled, and I'm on the horse, and he starts walking forward, and I'm like, well, I know what to do here. I haven't read the manual, but you pull back on the reins, and guess what? He starts going backwards. I didn't know horses go backwards, by the way. So guess what I do? I kick him, really gently though. And he starts going forward. So now, then, I grew up in Minnesota, right? We have docks, we have boats, we have wind. So what do you do? You grab the dock. So I'm next to this big, this big steel 
you know, three inch corral steel beams all the way down about 80 yards. It was right next to me, so I grab it. And he goes forward, and he goes backwards, and he goes forward, and I finally get him to stop. I'm like, yeah, I own you. Now, any horse people in here? Any horse people? So there's a picture uh, right after this with me holding onto this fence, and this horse has his ears flat back and his chin down, and he knew he had a knucklehead on his back. So all of a sudden, he pulls away from the fence, and he starts trotting, and I'm trotting, and I don't like this, because this is really too bouncy for me. I'm kind of a big guy. But then all of a sudden, he just bolts, and he takes off, and I'm flat on my back, and his rump is pounding me in the shoulder blades, and I'm scared to death. I'm going to flip off the back of this horse and get kicked in the head and die. So what do I do? I squeeze with my legs as hard as I possibly can so I don't flip off the horse. Horse people, what am I telling the horse? Go faster. Yes, and he understood. He went to full afterburner. Man, he took off. Man, this is, man, he's like, you got it, buddy. <laughs> and as we're going, we're going right along this fence line, and way down there is a whole bunch of paddocks, all with these steel beams, and it's clear off to the left. And I'd never been on a horse at a run let alone a flat out run before, but I reach down and I grab the rein. I'm like, well, we just have to turn a little bit. So I grab the rein and I pull. And he takes his head and he pulls his head straight back. Doesn't even break stride. He's like, well, roll. <laughs> Try that again. Grab the rein, pull even harder. And he doesn't even break stride again. Pulls his head straight back. And I literally start panicking. I'm like, I gotta jump off this horse, but if I jump off this horse, I'm gonna break my neck. If I break my neck, I'm gonna die. I don't wanna die. Now listen, I've been shot at. I've flown in combat. I've raised three teenagers. Nothing had prepared me for this moment of my life. His hooves are thundering, the wind is in my face, and we are now at a full gallop, and now that fence is 20 yards away. There was no escape. Have you guys ever had that moment where like everything just slows down and you have that moment of clarity? I remember something. This is not going to end well. And that's the last thing I remember. That horse came into the fence so hard, he dropped his butt and he bucked so hard, he actually flipped over and slammed into the fence on his uh, side on the ground rump first. And when he did that, I went Superman straight into a steel corral beam. It crushed. I literally broke every bone from here up. I crushed my skull. It was caved in. I broke my neck, shattered my shoulder, the bar down, crushed my entire rib cage, broke five ribs, punctured my left lung. I think the horse was fine, unfortunately. Uh, sorry, that's supposed to be my inside voice. Um, so I, I wake up on the ground, right? I blacked out. I do, I do not remember hitting the fence, but I woke up on the ground into more pain than I can even describe to you. My face is, this was all cut open and head wounds are not pretty. I can feel everybody around me. I can feel people holding my head, my shoulders, and my hips. And there's a woman, I can tell it's a woman holding my hand. And, and I didn't know what to do next. I mean, I, you know, God says, you know, have you ever heard the saying, God won't give you more than you can handle? It's not true. I'm just telling you that. This was beyond anything I could handle. I was panicking because of the pain. And all of a sudden, one of the guys there said, John, we just watched you. You're screaming, you're yelling, you're struggling. I was just trying to get away from the pain. I didn't know I was doing that at the time. He goes, all of a sudden, we just watched you just relax so completely. It looked like you were sinking into the ground. He thought he had just watched somebody die. But what happened was I was in the presence of the Lord. The other guy on the other side of me said he knew instantly he was on holy ground. He felt like he wanted to turn around and take off his shoes. And I'm laying there. I don't even know how bad my body's crushed. And I'm experiencing this overwhelming personal, I mean, this is between Father God and John. This wasn't like just some general love. It's like with me and my dad or my mom or my wife, but at a different level. I remember the first thought I had in my head that crossed my mind was, 
I'm not worthy of somebody loving me like this. It was like this love was the fabric of the universe, and I got to touch it. And somebody asked me, you know, afterwards, like, did God come down? Did he, like, appear? Like, what happened? I'm like, well, that's a great question. What I knew to be true as soon as you asked me that question is God was already there, right? God is above us. He is next to us. He's enthroned in us. What he did is he just revealed himself. He has been in this loving relationship with me my whole life and wants me to join him. And I just got to understand that for the first time. But as I'm laying there and feeling this love, I'm still in pain. And Shannon, when you sang uh, Jehovah Shalom last night about your peace, I was over here crying because all of a sudden I felt that peace that passes all understanding and it was physical. Like when you're at the edge of a beach and you're there at the end, end of the sand and the waves are, you know, washing in. This peace just started washing over me. And it almost had a color to it. I almost want to say purple, but that is not right. I, it's hard to put into words. And as I felt this, these waves of this peace washing over me, all that pain and panic and fear that I was in physically was completely taken away. And didn't come back, by the way, um, until the life flight. It took an hour for them to get to me. And then I heard God speak. It was a voice that came from everywhere and nowhere. It was not to my ears. It was like this consciousness flowing through me. If somebody said, where is God in you today? I would tell you it's right here. Because that's where I felt him. Where's Holy Spirit? Right here. Right? Where's Christ? Here's what he said. And this is kind of where I was with my faith because I didn't know where this came from in the Bible. The first thing he said to me was, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Then he said, John, I'm going to heal you and use this for my glory. That the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And as soon as he said that, I knew my left eye was permanently blind because all the bones behind my eye socket had shattered and cut the optic nerve. So my... My left eye does not work at all. It's completely blind. And then I, I woke up and he left. I opened my eyes and I said very calmly, I said, God's here. You don't have to worry. It's going to be okay. And the woman holding my hand's a paramedic. She's a believer. She'd been in the field for 30 years and she's like, yeah, no, I don't think so. She, I heard later, she did not think I would survive until the life flight came, that it was not medically possible just because my brain was caved in. They did a spec scan later. There was almost... Uh, over 40% of my brain that was non-functional because of how severe this head injury was. But I was acting so normal, I'd just been in God's presence. When they first called my wife, they're like, hey, John got thrown off a horse, you should come up here. We were in Montana from Denver and just bring him home. They life flight me to the helicopter, uh, to the uh, trauma center, and they do a CAT scan, and they come and tell Dr. Dobson, how do you like to get this call? Dr. Dobson calls my wife. They, She's never met, but knows who he is, and says, hey, Donna, um, doesn't look good. I would really recommend that you guys try to come up here today, and you should bring the boys. Because everything that he was told was, this is not survivable. We were told by over four doctors that we've documented the medical injuries to me not only were not survivable, but best case scenario, I should have been a quadriplegic. I, I broke C2 and C4. Okay. So here I am laying in the hospital bed. That next month, I was, I was in ICU for five weeks. And then I was at Craig Hospital here in Denver with a severe traumatic brain injury for 20 months. This was a very long, God said he was gonna heal me. I kind of expected something a little shorter term, just so you know, as I was going through this. But I'm in, uh, I'll never forget that month that I'm in ICU, I, I have like three memories. I have post-traumatic amnesia, but there's one that I'll never forget. I'm laying in the hospital bed. I literally have seven IVs in me. And there's a doctor that comes in. White lab coat, red stitching, Dr. Van Gilder, neurosurgery. He's got thinning red hair. He's got a blue shirt and a gold tie. I'm like, I like you, go Navy. And he comes in, he starts talking to my wife about they, got a, they need to do a brain surgery. This is the first of two brain surgeries. They have to, he's talking to her, telling her, hey, we, will, we have to take his entire skull off. There's a lot of things that we have to fix. What I'm hearing from him talking to my wife is that 
the chances of you surviving or, or your husband surviving this surgery are very low. And I just want to, you to know that he's probably not going to be the person you remember afterwards. I was just quiet. She said, oh, well, that could be good. And she, but, here, but he looks down at my wife and says, hey, um, you know, Donna, do you have, does John have a will? And especially a living will. Now, folks, we had just redone our estate plan. So Donna looks at the doctor and says, hey, uh, we actually just redid our estate plan, and we were supposed to sign it as soon as we get back. And he looks down at Donna and says, well, you know what? We can wait till the morning. Can you please call your attorney and have it FedExed up here so John can sign that before we go into surgery, which is what she did. And as she left the room, I'm laying there in bed. Even though I'd just been in God's presence about a few days earlier, I was convinced of one thing. The next weekend was my funeral. And I started playing the movie. What had the sum total of my life at 45 years old meant? Had I lived a life so the use of my life would outlive my life? I got to tell you, man, personally, I, w I was convicted. It had not. I started thinking, about, you know, what would everybody say at the funeral, right? Because you know what you do at a funeral? You all say nice things. That's what you do. But what would everybody say at the back of the church, right, when they're rooting around for the roast beef sandwiches and potato salad? And what would they say a year later or two years later? Like, oh, man, yeah, he's a good guy. What, what was his wife's name again? I wonder how she's doing. Anyway, Jeremy, how's business? How's things at the Broadmoor? I was that guy. And I had to figure out how to make changes. I was so convicted. And now, as I recovered, I got to tell you, uh, it, it, it was really hard. It was probably harder for my wife because she was now, she'd been a stay-at-home mom, homeschooling our kids, her dream, and now she's my caregiver. So for two and a half years, we had no income at all. We just started a new company. I had an $824,000 lien against me for medical bills. My health was completely compromised. The front left lobe of my brain was injured. This is where you have emotional control um, rational thought, social filter, as I'm recovering from all these different surgeries. Imagine this. My kids, they come in, and they're just laughing and being kids. And my thought is they're, they know that I'm dealing with all this stuff, and they don't care. So you know what I start doing? I start screaming and swearing and yelling at them, and I have no idea that I'm doing something wrong or hurtful. Or they're at the table, and I... They said something a little bit off color, and guess what? I completely revert back to my Navy days, and my wife is, oh, you did not. You leave right now. You're going to your room. I mean, it was bad. I, because of this injury that I was going through, there was, and, and, and the pain of all these surgeries, there was times where I'd take an oxycodone that literally would take only the edge off for 30 minutes, and I couldn't take another one for three and a half hours, and I, my entire goal would be, Lord, just tell me to get through the next five minutes. And when I hit that five minutes, hey, Lord, just help me get the next five minutes. And Lord, help me fix all this stuff because I'm making a mess here and I don't even know that I'm making a mess. And here's what I realized. I, I was at a conference like this. This was about three years after the accident, about five years ago. I heard Henry Black be speaking. He was talking about strongholds. What are those things that really hold you back from a deep and true relationship with the Lord? And what I realized for me, it was anger. He saved my life. But I was angry about how he did it and what I had to go through. And, when I, and he already knew it. And when I admitted that, I got to tell you, man, it was like a whole new awakening for me. And I went back to my, I'll never forget sitting down with my son, the one who, uh, my middle son, he's emotional, he's the one that has a, a father and my grandson. And I sat down on my knees with him and I asked for him to forgive me. Like I just asked God to forgive me. And we sat there in our beds, hugging and crying for about a half hour. But I can tell you today that everything in my life has been restored, the important things. I've, my marriage is better than it's ever been in my life. Each one of my boys is my absolute best friends. Everything I get to do today, I get to serve people. And so here's something I learned as I went through this. Right? I, I used to pray, God, what is your will for my life? I need clarity. I need discernment so I can make a decision and move forward. And guess what? 
that was, for me, that, that was absolutely the wrong approach. Because action begets clarity. And I had to ask myself two very important questions. And it came one day, I was working with, and any of you guys in here know Jeff Spadafora from the Halftime Institute. I said to Jeff over coffee one day, I said, you know what, Jeff, I, I gotta, as I'm recovering, I gotta figure out how I'm wired so then I can figure out what to do next. He goes, John, I think you should ask you that question a little bit differently, it might help you out. He goes, why don't you ask yourself, how did God wire you, and what did he wire you for? Why don't you think of it from that perspective? And so I sought out to answer two very important questions. Who really is God? I've now read the Bible over and over, every year now, so I've read it now eight times. My entire focus is try to under, just better understand who the Lord is so I can develop this loving relationship with him. And my prayer is no longer, what is your will for my life? But Lord, I ask that you reveal to me your plans in the world. And what is your will? And what do I need to do to change and adapt to join you? So God has given me this incredible second chance to live a life fully alive. And I believe that that is exactly where I'm at right now. And here's the good news I'm going to share with you guys. I'm not special. He loves you guys absolutely as much. He's there with you just like he was with me. And this morning, for every single one of us in here was another second chance. And here's the cool thing. Because if you missed it this morning, tomorrow is another second chance. So each day, just focus on the present. Look for God's will. And just ask yourself, what is that next small step forward that you need to take into the life and the things that God has ready for you? Thank you, guys.